Hey, Twitter world, it's me, yours truly. Let me start off today by congratulating Elon Musk for taking over Twitter. Uh, maybe I can get authenticated. Maybe I can get a blue check. I've tried for years to get that blue check because there's so many fake O.J. Simpson accounts. One of them is the real O.J. Simpson, and uh, instead of an O, they have a zero. In any event, there have been a bunch of them, and from time to time, people would say, why did you say this? And i say, I didn't say it. That was one of those fake accounts. And I'm sure a lot of people probably deal with that. Uh, so maybe that will come to an end. Maybe that's what y'all love to sell, too, so many fake accounts. Hello and welcome to Lottery Pod. That's not how, how to win the lottery. <laughs> so I got good news and bad news. Good news. Mm, maybe not good news, bad news. True thing. This is our season finale. False thing. I don't know when this is coming out. All the dates. Remember like Happy New Year, Merry Christmas, whatever. All those dates are out the window because we added a book. We added yeah. a book. We had an interview, which we have not done yet. But this is for sure the season finale. It is. Next week, we will announce season four. Okay. This is our final book in the internet module, Fake Accounts by Lauren Euler. I'm Joey Lewandowski. You know, uh, uh, Lauren Euler has, um, we can add her to the pantheon of funny Instagram names. What's her Instagram name? Law and Euler. Ooh, that's good. Pretty good, yeah. I tried to get her to interview and her, uh, her publicist or whatever did not get back to me. Yeah, so. well, some people are, are you know, uh, busy. Some people are maybe uh, think of themselves as too good for us in multiple ways. I will also say, unlike many of the authors, this module DMs not open. Yeah. I, I think I, understand. I don't, so, probably. Well, here's the thing. Like I don't blame anyone for not having their DMs open, much less someone who is even remotely a public figure. I have a very important update. As of 23 hours ago, Megan Boyle and I are now friends on Goodreads. Oh, okay. She liked my review of her book. And then I was just like, Ooh, cool. Yeah. Anyway, fake accounts. Isn't your picture of on Goodreads of Ryan Gosling? It's saying I would never dog at your pages, girl. You are such a fucking dork. I, I added that when I made Goodreads like 15 years ago, and I'm never going to change it. <laughs> oh, you embarrass me. Uh, I mean, you. Your name is not your name. You don't even have a picture. At least, That's I, right. at I least don't I try to think. Because I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, yeah. Every time, like, I forget about it, and then I remember, and I'm like, it's pretty funny. I love it. Yeah. Anyway, I think my full name is on there. Anyway, fake accounts. Lauren Euler, Bob or Treads, whatever. Uh, what is? <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna hear it next week. We got, we got, got a soundboard. If this episode sounds different, I hope it sounds better. We're recording to a new device. It's got lots of sounds. Uh, overuse them next week. But Shreds, what is fake accounts about? I'm going to use the voice disguiser as you do this. This is terrible. <laughs> I'm going to put a gun in my mouth. All right. <clears throat> I don't know. What What do you think ducking is? I don't know. What, what, is, don't, what is ducking? Go ahead. Docking? Ducking. Oh, I know I docking. Say, I was going to say, I can show you I don't what think, docking is. I don't think docking is a sound effect. I think it's an action. Yeah, yeah. What is Fake Accounts about? Uh, it's a it's a book about um, a woman who has a boyfriend who she discovers that he has a hidden Instagram account that is a conspiracy theory account. And then... Mm -hmm. It moves forward plot wise from there. Yes. Uh, and the, t I, I think this is one of my favorite titles this season. Cause I think sure. the title of, applies to a handful of different things as the narrative goes on. Um, some quick background from her wiki. So she was born and raised. This is cool. I just got this because it's a cool town born and raised in hurricane, West Virginia. Uh, -huh. that's just a cool town. Um, this book came out in February 2021. I don't remember when this episode comes out, if it's 2022 or 2023. Actually, let's see. 2023, so it came out two years ago. Um, she graduated from Yale. Shout out to the Eli's out there. Shout out to my co-host on Too Fast, Too Forever, who works there. Uh, she moved to Berlin, of course. So this is, I think, so, at least somewhat, if not largely, autobiographical, but it is fiction. I had a, Yeah, I had a lot of discussions with people about the <clears throat> whether or not this book was autobiographical and whether or not this book was satire. 
Mm. Um, well, I think we will also probably get into that as we go on. And I think probably in, in Egg's email too, right? I would imagine. Or maybe yeah, not. That seems likely. Um, from the wiki, quote, the narrator of fake accounts bears obvious resemblances to Euler, leading several critics to remark on the difficulty of establishing the extent to which the narrator is based on or parodies the author. Some critics argue this is a way for Euler to push her readers to reflect on the ways they regularly package themselves for consumption from dating apps and social media. We all engage in reinventions of ourselves. The only other thing I want to mention, and I think this is pretty cool, is that in February of 2022, it was reported they were going to adapt this into a TV series. Did you hear this? No. The project will be produced by Ben Sinclair, who is the guy from High Maintenance, but also involved Julia Garner, Ruth Conda forever. Oh, don't say Ruth Conda, Jesus. <laughs> and also people compare this a lot to another book that we have covered this season. No one's talking about this by Patricia Lockwood. Which came out the same month as this book. Uh, I don't. I don't see any similarities between them. Wiki says both deal with the internet and its intrusion into day to day life. Uh, yeah, okay, that's like that's wild. this entire module. Yeah, though. that's incredibly, incredibly broad. So I'll, I'll say that the reason why um, the conversations that I had that revolved around whether or not this was satire, um, I think revolved around whether or not she was satirizing the political positions that the author takes. Or that 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 the the main character takes, which are uh, somewhat critical of um, a certain kind of feminism, mm -hmm. and somewhat critical. Uh, I, I would say I would say cynical of liberal politics and of liberal posturing and of the ways in which uh, that sort of thing is not only consumed, that sort of media is consumed, but by how that media is um, propagated by by the people in, involved. In, in those circles. Um, and I, I, I don't I don't think that it's satire. I think that she is cynical in roughly the correct measure. So this is the second time you read this book. Is that correct? Yeah, and correct. I know that some of your friends who also read this, one of whom wrote in, one of whom did not write in, did not particularly care for this book. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you told me that, I was still, I think, relatively early-ish in the book. And I think, as I heard that, I think it's a matter of how to the point you were just making about satire, like how much you can sort of like stomach or stand this type of narrator. Well, it's also, it's also, I'll say, I think that I poisoned the well in my conversation with them because they, in, in the conversation, they were talking about it being satire. And I said, I don't know guys. Like, I think that this is a lot closer to Lauren Euler's voice than, than you're thinking that it is. And, and like my example is a fairly brutal book review that she wrote about Roxanne Gay's book, Bad Feminist, where she's critical of uh, Roxanne Gay, who has become a kind of uh, avatar for a certain kind of uh, okay. progressive, progressive thought. And she was criticizing that, saying that like, you know, in that book review, she's saying that like that kind of, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to paraphrase her entire book review, but it's, not, it's, it's like, you know, she's not holding herself accountable enough for, for uh, the standards of feminism as, as we see it. Gotcha. Okay. So she was being critical of Roxanne Gay in, in that way, but her tone is this kind of like borders between righteous and self-righteous and is condemning in a way that is like seems judgmental in a way that we've sort of, I, I think culturally, at least on the left, moved away from. We've moved away from this idea of bad reviews of things in favor of like – a sort of inelegant positivity and, and, and like, for all things. Yeah. Away, away from like aesthetic criticism or even criticism of ideas, because we shouldn't be criticizing people that are on our side because the reason why Republicans so regularly defeat, uh, Democrats, progressives, liberals, whatever is largely because we on the left have a much harder time agreeing than, people on the right they, they tend to be able to just get on board with each other and support each other but it's much more difficult on the, on the left to do that sure. and and so like i think that her cynicism um can make people uncomfortable because it's critical of a thing that we should be supportive of i don't want to say blindly but should be supportive of in a way that like isn't detrimental to the advancement of those ideas the narrator in this is never named. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's probably true. So I think I think that's what makes it sort of tough. And I think that like 
Why does that make it sort of tough? No, no, no. I think I think it makes it tough to like pretend that it's parody because it's. I think by not naming the character like another L name, for instance, like Lily or whatever. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's just like or like Laura. It's like no, this is probably even though it's fiction, it feels like it's closer to her. And I think the I think you're right in the like like I can I can understand where she's coming from. Like at one point she goes to the women's march after Trump gets elected, and she's like, oh, I don't want to be here. Yeah, these aren't my like I don't like these hats are stupid. Uh, these, I, I don't have anything in There's common too with many these people. people. There's too many people. It's like, I thought I wanted to do this because I thought about it in, in like terms of like sisterhood or something like that. But also like now that I'm here, I feel alienated and, and all of these other things. Right. And I think that there's like an honesty. Cause I think what you were saying before is that like, we're supposed to be like, this is a good thing. We're supposed to be supporting these people, but like, there's a certain reality where just like, Oh, there, this is unwieldy. I don't want to be mm-hmm. here. Like she thinks she goes down there kind of not against her will, but like, sort of with the best intentions but kind of guarded than just like oh i don't i wish i didn't do this yeah the thing that stuck out to me the most about this book because i always like the way like the sort of the, the physical structure of like chapters and stuff and there's like five sections and there's the middle where it's nothing happens which is like by far the longest amount of the book yeah and it's just kind of her just doing well i will say dating that, profiles that, that that part is pretty boldly satire of a certain kind of auto fiction that is largely written uh, by women um, of a, of like roughly her age. It's, it's like an entire version of literature that became popular. And so she is writing in that mode in a kind of critical way. So she is satirizing something, but it's just not, she's not satirizing like the cynical political opinions of someone who's like above liberalism. Right. Where do you want to start with this? Because I feel like there's a thing that happens uh-huh. and then another thing that happens and then a thing that undoes the second thing. So she discovers her boyfriend has a fake, has an Instagram account that is propagating uh, conspiracy theories, um, only particular kinds of conspiracy theories. He's not propagating conspiracy theories that involve sex with children or anything like that. Um, it's mostly what 9-11 stuff yeah. or or like other things that I guess like can be. I don't know. This is hard to categorize because like I feel like she's trying to categorize them as like non-harmful conspiracy theories right. that you can sort of roll your eyes and laugh about, which is like I make 9-11 conspiracy theory jokes all the time, um, but I'm not presenting myself as someone who genuinely believes those things. And you're like, also not like you haven't cultivated a, a devoted following where you were actually yeah. spreading misinformation. Yeah. You're saying it like in a text thread or to a friend or something right. like but that. But his and his misinformation thread, his, his misinformation is like um, a joke that maybe some people are in on. There's intentional misspellings. There's a stupidity to it that is obvious. Um, and he is cultivating a following that might be in on the joke and might not be in on the joke. And I guess we're, we're led to question whether or not being in on that kind of joke is worth anything because people who are in on that kind of joke tend to ultimately end up being people who stop joking Yep. Uh, after a certain point. Which we kind of saw similarly or in a related way and we had to remove this post for sure yeah yeah where it's about like when you're being exposed to those kind of ideas whether you're susceptible to it or not at a certain point after you've seen enough of it you're like no that's probably true Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is dangerous that's Mm -hmm. where the scary part comes in so she sees that she finds this out and she's like i'm gonna dump him but like i'm gonna slow play it yeah and she's like trying to ask like leading questions guiding questions whatever and then we kind of flash back to when they met and like we we learn that he's kind of been lying to her forever yeah he lied to her when they first met said that he was someone that he wasn't and then when she found him out he like sort of walked it back and and turned that line to like a charming little thing that we do at work because we know that we're never going to see these people again right which which is understandable right but it's also it also like um you know sort of maps real life onto the internet in an interesting way because we all have these things about ourselves that we hide or present certain versions of ourselves that uh, are the equivalent of, of catfishing people, the equivalent mm-hmm. of fake accounts, they're the equivalent of, you know, lying about our job, lying about our background, lying about our history of anything. Yeah. Of, of whatever um, we make ourselves seem cooler in, in retrospect, you know, I'm not actually a 39 year old fucking loser. I did this cool thing when I was younger. Well, you're not. You did the cool thing when you were younger. Yeah, I wasn't talking about myself. I don't know what would make you believe that I was. Well, I think that like later when she's doing like the dating profile thing as, you know, I, I've, as someone who has uh, 
spend too much time in those waters. You want to talk about the date that you went on last night? No. Are you sure you don't want to go into that right now yeah. and, and talk about like we, a bunch of details? I don't know anything about it. You can tell me the whole story right now. No, it's nice. Nothing salacious. I don't want salacious. Jesus, I don't want. I you don't said want to, all the details. Yeah, but when I when I say all the details, I mean like uh, what kind of interests does she have? What are your? I I don't want to know if you if you are. But I think that there's something fascinating about like specifically with that, but also with any social media where you're presenting a version of yourself to the world, and she is calling it out in an explicit way by like lying about who she is to literally every person that she meets. Yeah. And, uh, like we're jumping ahead, but I think that that's, that was to me the most sort of relevant, most interesting version of the fake accounts mm -hmm. because like the conspiracy thing, like I don't spend, like I know that they exist, but I don't spend time in those wells and those rabbit holes, but I know that they're out there. Well, it's also, it's also, that stuff is interesting to me because it, exists in the book as a non-starter like it, it's like an inciting incident what does the conspiracy theory account stuff yeah. it's a, it, it's an inciting incident and then in a different book it would it would be the propulsive thing that exists throughout the plot that she's like driven to discover yeah what what goes on here but because it's it's like not that kind of book because it's a book that skews, I think, a lot more closely to reality. Mm -hmm. um, really, all that does is cause like a minor internal crisis that allows her to explore certain aspects of herself that really have nothing to do with Felix or the conspiracy theory account. Well, I think that's also helped along by the fact that Felix dies. Yeah. Right. Like relatively, not early in the book, but like no, it's early. I mean, he dies hundred-ish pages. He, he, yeah, he dies when she's at the women's march. Yes, and and she gets a a phone call and from his mom, from his mom, and she's like hit with the kind of grief that you feel that is unexplainable because you don't. It's not filled with sadness. It's more just like it's shock that the world has changed in some way. Yeah, and also it removes her agency from. Like, she had this thing on him. She had this thing. Like, he's a person that I think in their relationship she felt inferior to him in certain ways because he was sort of above it all, uh, seemed smart, had most of the right opinions, had a very, um, like, cool take on things. He was a painter, but, like, when she asked him if how he, how he was at painting, he said he was okay, right? He seemed very self-assured and not egotistical and seemed ultimately, like, fairly cool just happened to be living like a separate secret life and, but when she discovered this thing about him that obviously he didn't want her to discover she had something on him she had something that she could use to show her superiority to him in certain ways and so when he dies part of the grief is that he took that away from her she can no longer she'll never be able to show him that she's superior to him right because he'll never know that she found him out He'll never know that she knew that he was doing this incredibly lame thing. Um, and so, like, th that's an, uh, like, an unending thread. She doesn't have the, the, there's no satisfactory conclusion to their relationship to her. Um, she doesn't get to break up with him. She has to, like, let it keep going for forever. Remind me of the beginning. Was she going to break up with him before she finds this? Because it seems like they're, like, in a, like, she's not super happy, but she's, like, yeah, kind of content. It, it seems like their relationship is coming to an end. And and so, like, this but is a real reason. To this is, it. like, the, hey, you did this and now I'm done. Like, I have, I have a reason to get out other than just, like, this isn't working. Yeah. And so when she discovers it, she becomes, like, a little bit, at least briefly, more committed to the relationship. She wakes up early. She makes him pancakes. She, like. Like, Which is a purpose, in yeah. Conversation because, like, knowing that this is the end provides her with a purpose to interact with him more, right? And she's also spending more time, like, tracking him, like, paying more attention to him to see when he's doing things, following this account without following the account, but like watching him bring a phone to the bathroom and seeing, like, oh, he just posted this thing, yeah. So, like, being attentive in a way that maybe she should have been or could have been but in a healthier way, but just like now she's driven to do a thing. And then one thing leads to another. She goes down to the women's March and then he dies. And then he dies. Cause it seems like she's going to like, she, she confides in her coworkers. I think who she, she catches a ride down to Washington DC with that. Like this is what's been going on and I'm going to break up with him and whatever. And they're like, Oh, okay. Uh, we don't really know each other, but then, okay, that's crazy. And then 
before she's actually able to do it, she gets the call and just like, oh. And so then it's just like, well, I don't know what to do now because it felt like she had her at least short term future mapped out. And now that's no longer the case. Yeah. So what she does is uh, Felix's mom wires her a thousand dollars to attend a to presumably attend There's to no, presumably yeah. attend a memorial service on the West Coast where Felix is originally from. And because they met in Berlin, but they live in New York because she was a tourist and he did the tour guide. And they, when he moved to the U.S., they started living together in New York. Yeah. And so instead, she takes that thousand dollars and moves to Berlin, moves mm-hmm. back to Berlin. Even though it sort of seems like kind of temporary, but like she never really, I don't think she ever comes back. Right? Well, she, yeah, she doesn't have like a plan. She wants to, you know, live her life. Yeah. And, and in a way kind of, I think she says explicitly like to make Berlin hers in a way that it wasn't when she was just like following Felix's lead when they were together over there. Yeah. Even though it, even though arguably she is following Felix's lead even more now, in that she is uh, constructing false identities and living vicariously through those identities in ways that she is is not uh, as her authentic self. Mm-hmm. And her whole, like, time over there is very frustrating from the, like, productivity sense where, like, she has a – not a great-paying job, but, like, a steady job of walking babies. And it seems like that's the only way she makes money. And it's just like, how are you – like, what are you doing? Like, everybody's just like, no, you're in Europe now, baby. You can just – Get by. Yeah, I think the idea is that she she says she's making seven euros an hour, but um, she says that that's enough to pay for where her living her living space and then some. So mm-hmm. it's enough money for you know her to make fourteen or fifteen or fourteen or twenty one euros a day mm-hmm. um, while she's living there, which sounds unbelievably cheap, but right on. Um, but maybe she's in like a really kind of like sketchy part of town well i mean she's also sharing in a part it's not like she, she's right. she, she's living in a co-op it's not like she's you know got her own three-bedroom place or something like that she's really i think living like a student life and i would imagine also moving from new york to literally anywhere else is like oh everything's so cheap here i can get by with like no money yeah i mean plus she's got the thousand dollars that yeah even a plane ticket whatever but like she doesn't have like long-term plans she's just i'm just gonna do this thing and just see where she kind of wants to write a little bit but it doesn't seem like she really actually writes much in the in the narrative and she just kind of wanders around the city, walks these babies every morning and then decides to start doing dating online dating on OkCupid. Yeah. Where she takes on the persona of each of the astrological signs and meets different people in Berlin with no intention of ever sleeping with them or spending any time with them outside of one date to what purpose ultimately I'm not sure other than to gain experience of over, other people and to fool people the way that Felix fooled her. I think that was, the, that was what I took away from it, that she like still harbors resentment that she was tricked and now she wants to trick other people, which is just like sort of perpetuating like a cycle of abuse, which is mm-hmm. not great, but also I get it, but also not great. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, again, like I, th- this is like back to criticisms of her, like she is an unlikable narrator mm-hmm. and, and that's like frankly, part of the appeal of this to me is that there's not really any attempt by her to be like, no, guys, seriously, actually, I'm a good person. And here's the reason why, because of all these things that I went through, like she very boldly is is uh, unlikable. I think that's what actually what appealed to me. Like, I think you like this book more than I did, because I think this is I think you would you say you love this book? Yeah, I like it a lot. I appreciated that she did not really sugarcoat things that she was not afraid to portray herself as as a kind of a bad person mm-hmm. um in an interesting way where a lot of the other auto fiction a lot of the other lit that we've read it's much easier to empathize or sympathize with the uh, the protagonist than it is in here just like i don't really like you but i'm still kind of compelled to keep going yeah her her problems are self-created for the most part um she's also <clears throat> i think there's something about the way that she presents her arguments aesthetically that shows that she is uh, all this stuff is well considered. Mm-hmm. She's not making mistakes. She's not like going out there and doing things that um, are impulsive or like contrarian. She's, she's going out there and she's making specific decisions to be the kind of person that we don't like. Mm-hmm. And this is all, I think hurts our ability to relate to her because when people are making bad decisions impulsively, we 
sympathize that with that because I think most we we view most of our bad decisions as being impulsive. But when someone is writing in these sort of uh, absolutely perfect, concise, uh, very very clean, well punctuated sentences that have uh, no sort of flights of fancy in them, these are like one of my favorite things about this book is how like unbelievably meticulously well written it is. Every sentence yeah. is, is like beautiful mm-hmm. and like perfectly rounded and and everything fits exactly within the container that she she's putting it in. There's no sloppiness to anything here. It's structured within an inch of its life from from the entire thing, mm-hmm. whether it be like broken down into the segments to each like paragraph as its own individual unit of meaning to the sentence to not only the sentence, but to the, the, the semicolonic breaks in the sentences yep. to, to where it's like the, the language of it is so unbelievably precise that that reflects directly on like when we talk about aesthetics being character, when you're talking about a first person narrator, um, whose words are so precise, like it gives us a sense of a precise person and a person who's not making the mistakes that we think of that are willing to be forgiven. Because when someone is that well put together and that well planned out, we tend to think of them as like these Lex Luthor characters who are like enacting sort of uh, this sort of puppet mastery over the other characters in the book. And so I think all that stuff makes us less forgiving of her. Um, and then also maybe we're less forgiving, just g- generically less forgiving of her because uh, because she's a woman. And I think that we're less likely to accept these kinds of characters as, as female characters. That's probably true. I, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. I did text you while I was reading that I think I thought back to our conversation with Beth Morgan and you giving her the compliment of like the exclamation point sure. and how yeah, yeah. wonderful it was. Also, Felix dies in a bicycle accident, just like Alicia in Touch of Jen, which is sure. yeah. our second bike mm-hmm. death this uh-huh. season. Um, but I think, I think I agree with you, what you were saying earlier that she's a great writer, but like, I think specifically the punctuation is just like, like everything is just so well written. Like this is not by page count, not much longer than a lot of the other books, but like, it's a much slower read Sure is, yeah, for many other reasons. And I think it's because number one, not a lot is happening, but also number two, it's, it's dense in a way that is not intimidating, but just like you, you need to like. I think it it requires closer reading yeah, than a that lot le- of what the, other things we've read. Yes, this season. That, that level of precision in writing requires you to, uh, you know, walk through it at a window shopping pace, as opposed to something that is much faster and looser, and you can sprint through. Mm-hmm. Like I, you know, as I read these through on Kindle, I highlight a lot of different things, and I feel like I highlighted more. And not even specific things that like I want to talk about in the episode, but just things that I like the wording of or mm-hmm. things that I like the way that she wrote it or whatever. And funny, but also like not laugh out loud funny, just kind of like smart. Yeah. And I just highlighted, I think, more things than like I have from maybe any other book this season. I think it's just like she she's great at what she does. Not that other people that we've covered have not been great at what they do. Well, I mean, I think that she is specifically great at like the – like I feel like she is someone who works as an editor much more than the other people that we've like like the, the this feels like a more meticulously edited and um like shine like I feel like she's like done a done a shine on every sentence in in this book and there's a kind of irony to the fact that her profession i would imagine in real life but also for sure in this book is that she's a blogger for one of those kind of like trash just like no i out. she no she she works for the uh i i think so this part in the book is fictionalized I th- well I, I i don't know I, I mean she may have written for some trashy like uh buzzfeed style right web, but but like she writes for the london review of books okay. she's like a you know because there cause I, I thought there was an irony in the fact that the author Again, trying to separate the author from the character. The author is this like precise writer and the character is so sort of beyond or over the process of writing. And she's like, I figured out my voice and I can just like turn out things. Well, I think this is, you know, it's you, you and I know this from listening to um, like a podcast like Comedy Bang Bang where you have like these people on it who are, in my opinion, some of the funniest people in the world, mm-hmm. but then they show up on stuff that's just garbage. Yep. And it's like, well, that's because like, or, or like there are like Saturday Night Live writers that like, you know, are 
some of the the funniest people, but then you watch right. that live and you don't laugh once. And right. It's like, oh, because like not everything always translates and like they're at a job right mm-hmm. now. They're not right. Like, you know, people individually can be incredibly funny or can be whatever. But then once you put them in this context at where, where they're getting a paycheck, um, they might end up writing something that's like, you know, or they write a Disney movie or something like, like the guys from the state wrote, uh, Herbie fully loaded. And, and like it, we cover that on too fast. Great movie. No, uh, okay. Not a great movie. Um, but like, yeah, you, you have this. So, so like, I'm sure I, I know like there are probably, it wouldn't surprise me if some of the greatest writers in the world were writing for, um, Buzzfeed or something like that. Like that's not no shade to anyone that, that works yeah. at any of those places because like people are trying to get paid and people need to get paid and the ability to get paid with that skill set is diminishing very quickly. So like, yeah, she probably is like this unbelievably talented writer that that can write these beautiful sentences, but then is like stuck in listicle hell. I do like how dismissive she is. Like the one quote that I copied into my notes was, I was a blogger if that wasn't clear. I would have liked to claim a more dignified title, journalist or writer or critic or reporter, but I didn't because I didn't want to contribute to the rapid deterioration of those titles. I was hoping to one day claim them and scrape off some legitimacy for myself. My job was to write two to three articles per day about, quote, culture, items about celebrities or suggestive studies or lately politics. And though that may seem like a lot, like a lot, it quickly became totally doable, not so bad at all. And it's just like she knows that she wants to aspire to a thing, but she's like, I'm not even like I don't want I don't want the the low caliber work that I've been doing just to get by to like mar what you think is as, as a journalist. Well, I also, I also th- that's a great example of a quote because it, it like, I think highlights a couple of different things that we're talking about right here, because it's like, firstly, I kind of agree with what she's saying mm-hmm. because I think that like, there is a level of prestige that something like a uh, reporter or whatever has that blogger doesn't, but also at the same time, it is creating these hierarchies that like allow people to be snobbish about sure. things in, in like exactly the way that I was just dismissive of, because I do think that probably some, you know, you might be one of the best writers in the world stuck writing listicles for Buzzfeed. So like, um, she's saying something that is, is true, but also she's could be nicer about it and she's being a snob. So like when you, when you read it, you're like, you simultaneously, recognize the truth in it and then condemn yourself for recognizing the truth in mm-hmm. it because you don't want to be the kind of snob that she's being. And then you dislike her for making you think of yourself as a snob. Right. So it's like a real, she's doing a re, what I think is like a really, really complicated thing here. And it's a complicated, it's a, it's also a thankless complicated thing because so many people w- are going to walk away from that sentence, not recognizing the acrobats that she's doing mm-hmm. and acrobatics that she's doing, but instead just going like, what a fucking asshole. But I think what also, like, I think what you can sort of use to defend her against that, cause I think that's all fair, but like she's taking herself, herself down too. Like she's like, I'm not, I'm, I am condemning this line of work as like not worthy, but also like. That's what I'm choosing to do. Like, yeah, I but she's be- also she's also a person that in, in, in that moment f- does feel like she will one day be a reporter. And so she is going to leave behind all of these other sorry suckers who are just bloggers who are right? not able to ascend from that yeah. station in life. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like someone it's like someone who is a, a, a nurse or something who's going to medical school and then like says to another nurse, like, I don't want to be just a nurse. Right. And just like, fuck you, yeah. just a nurse. And I think that's something that like that that comes back a few times throughout where, you know, she's applying for this visa toward the end where she like, she wants to stay in Berlin cause she's only there for a certain amount of time. And she has a rich friend wire her 10 grand to prove like, Hey, I have money. Like I can stay here. And then the woman who's paying her is just like, why are you, wor- why do you have this job? If you have this kind of money, she's like, Oh, you know, whenever, like, I just like to stay busy. But it's like, again, sort of the, like the humbling of like what I'm doing doesn't really matter, but also it's important. And it just, it, there's the kind of, is it shade and fraud? No, that's maybe, maybe, I don't know. But like she's trying to convince herself of one thing while also convincing the reader and the people around her of another thing. It's just interesting that she's like, there's, there's lots of layers to the deception here that she's trying to fool everyone and kind of at the same time, like fooling no one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, in some ways, maybe trying to fool herself, but also like you can't fool yourself. No. Right. Although she kind of try, I, I think she kind of does to a certain extent fool herself a little bit, maybe. Mm hmm. And then, of course, we learn that Felix has faked his death, which is wild. I mean, I kind of, 
I didn't see that coming, but I was like, it's kind of in the TV, like the Game of Thrones, like you didn't see a body. It's just like, well, we don't know that, like she just got a phone call and just assumed. Yeah, it's also it's also something that is like interestingly fake. It is interestingly fake dramatic in a novel of sort of extreme realism, right? Because it's like everything about this book feels very much real. The characters in it are real. The events that she's talking about, are they're, they really happened. We can all remember when this stuff was going on mm-hmm. in real time. Mm-hmm. We know all the apps that she's talking about. We know the dating experience that she's talking about. But nobody knows anyone who faked their own death. No. That's not something that really happens. Right. And so, like, you're it's it's this again juxtaposition of fakiness with like this extreme realism that you know is jarring, especially because like it doesn't have and even even the reaction to that fakiness is still realism. It doesn't have any of the like soap opera melodrama reaction that you would have if this were uh, a a television show or something. It's the response is to send him an email being like, what the fuck, man? Yeah. Like that's such a weird thing to do. Even though she doesn't want to, she knows she shouldn't and she still can't help herself from doing that thing. Yeah. Which is how I feel about everything that I react to. I'm like every, every single reaction that I have in my life, I'm just like, stay cool. Don't Don't send the tweet. Don't send the tweet. And then I just do it anyway. Yep. Self-sabotage, baby. What was that t- t-shirt that you wanted me to get? It was like, it was like, uh, Oh, I'm on your girl's. Hold on. <laughs> it's really funny. Hold I'm on. on your girl's Facebook account arguing with someone else about politics or something like that. Yeah, it was, um, I'm at your girl's crib using her laptop to argue politics on Facebook. Yeah. The other one was born a piss forced to come. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I mean, both accurate representations of my life. Yeah. I also think it's it's funny that like her biggest grievance at Felix is the fact that he used one of her tweets in his, in his explanation. It's like, you didn't even credit me, man. Oh, well, no. I mean, I think that like part of that is the reason why she's pissed off about that is because the rest of it can be dismissed as not being about her. And then that is like, oh no, like he remembers this thing that I did was wounded by it and is making fun of me. And this whole thing, like he posted this to Instagram, knowing that I would see it, knowing that I would recognize it as me. So all of this actually is about me. Yeah. Which is like a jarring, scary thing to maybe flattering. Maybe. I don't know. I guess it depends on how you're viewing things. Yeah. I think, I think flattering. I mean, I would be, I would be both flattered and infuriated by it. I think like, I don't think he's doing it to get back at her, but she is the one that should be most impacted by this. And the fact that she's kind of not is. Well, he posted, telling. he posted months later and it's something that she tweeted. Like, so it's like, right. he like wrote down a yeah. tweet that she said with like the idea that he would later on, like posted in a weird attack on her, which is like also vaguely, like it's sort of vaguely misogynistic. Cause the tweet is I'm a pretty girl and I'm always late. And which is something that she was supposed to be going to a movie with him and she showed up late and they didn't get the seats that he wanted mm-hmm. because of that. And she had tweeted that in the interim, which she didn't think that he would ever see because he doesn't, he didn't have mm-hmm. social media. Um, but he not only saw it, but he held on to it for later so that he could post it and, shit. And, yeah. and like be mean about it after he came back from the dead. Like all of that stuff is so uh, precise in its attack yep. that, um, yeah, how would you not be hurt by that? It's like pretty brutal. Yeah. When you first read this, were you surprised that he was still alive? Yeah, for sure. Because I didn't because 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 by that point I had like forgotten about it. Yeah, he wasn't in the plot right. for so long, other than like brief mentions that like I thought it was like okay, well we're done with that. That's not what this book is about anymore. This book is about like how like the minutia of of how uh, the internet has sort of contaminated and morphed our personalities like is is so much more mundane than the dramatic act of someone's boyfriend dying or the dramatic act of having a fake conspiracy theory account like i thought it was about that mundanity which it still kind of is ultimately when you come when you come back around to it but yeah by that point i had just been like not thinking about felix at all because i think i i don't know i don't i want to use two different words here but i, I don't have two different words like i was not surprised that he was back mm-hmm but I also was caught off guard maybe um, because I think, and this has been proven wrong over and over in books that you pick, 
that in traditional narrative, you expect there to be a thing that happens at the end. But as we talked about episode after episode yeah. in the show, you love a non-ending. Yeah, I move away, I move away from that instinctively. And so to me, I was like, oh, if this book just ends with her like, and then I'm gonna have to walk the kids again or whatever, like just like, you know, whatever. Um, I'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Like I understand why Shreds loves this book or whatever, but it didn't surprise me that there was a thing that happened to end, mm -hmm. to sort of circle back and like mm -hmm. put a button on a thing. Um, I didn't think he was going to still be alive, but it was not surprising he was still alive. Well, I think it, it, I, I don't know that it's necessarily surprising to me either, but it's because it's like when it happens, it's not like you don't react by going like, oh, it's not one of these kind of moments. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was that a record scratch or a fart? It's sound. It, it's 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 a preloaded record scratch. That does sound like a fart. OK. Yeah. It's not it's it's not a moment where you think like like, oh, shit, because it's been sort of there have been so many styrofoam packing peanuts placed around it that mm -hmm. like by the time you get to that point it's like and there were no breadcrumbs like there's no way that you could be like oh i saw it right like, there are it, clues it, all along right it doesn't do the thing that like a good mystery does where a mystery will like like by the time you get to the result of the mystery you should have been able to figure it out which right. i think is proving the point of, like that's not what this is about yeah it's not a point it's and i also point. i do wonder if she was more observant the character here or maybe lauren Oil, i don't know do you think this happened in real life? Do you think she had a boyfriend who faked no. his own death? No. Um, if the character was more observant, I wonder if she could have seen this coming. But it seems like, well, Felix said, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. And it feels like she has removed herself from that world in more ways than one. Or like if she had just gone to the fucking memorial service. Right. Like if she had gone to the memorial service, it may have been like, surprise, I'm not dead. This was a prank. Well, she also sets herself up as being, uh, insert negative word here. I don't know what word to use, but like she gets $1,000 from the mom. She's like, I guess this is goodbye. And then she just used that to, to fly to Berlin. And then only like months later, she's like, oh, I bet it was for the funeral. Yeah. That's something that bothered uh, Meg and Heather too. And I was like, I don't, I just don't care about that. I no. feel like they wouldn't, if some, if it, like I wouldn't feel obligated, especially because earlier there's a part earlier in the text when she's talking about like when she was in college or whatever. And she says like, I decided very early on that if someone wealthier than me wanted to give me money, I was not going to turn it down. I was going to take it and do what I wanted with it. Which is a good mentality. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. When like all the times in my life that I've been like, I don't know, out with, um, you know, I'm not as broke now as I used to be. But like I would like congratulations when, when like Dylan was doing really well or something. Should I believe his and, name out? Yeah. Uh, but like he'll he'll be like, oh, I'll, I'll get dinner. Like I've never been like, I'm going to fight you for the check. It's, right. it's like if I'm broke, I'm like, you take that check. Sure. I'm not going to. Yep. I'm not going to argue in favor of me paying dinner for yeah, dinner. There was in, in by, by this point, it doesn't matter. And like, even the, at the time it didn't matter. But I remember when I was working at Best Buy and, you know, making Best Buy money and still living at home. Yeah. That's you're still Best Buy Joey to me. Thank you. I remember it was Christmas Eve and it was like 20 minutes before we closed. And this guy and this kid came in and like, basically the vibe was I fucked up. Didn't get my wife anything. Fix this. Help me fix this now. Yeah. And so he bought a very expensive MacBook with like the best protect. He spent like three or four grand. And then he like, as a thank you, like reached out to give me $20. So I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't accept that. And he's like, all right. And he just left. I was like, no, like if you said no, really, I'd be like, okay, take. But like in that moment, I was just like, no, I can't. And he's like, all right, fine. And I'm like, oh, I should have taken the money. Yes. Instead, what, like, what are you like? Well, I think I had, I think I was living in fear of the best buy overlords. No, I think I was told at one point, like, oh, if somebody offers you money. You're not really supposed to take it. And then like I said it to somebody, they're like, no, you always take the money. I'm like, always take the money. Why didn't I take always the money? Always take the money. Which now, I mean, who doesn't want $20? But like back then when I was making Best Buy money as opposed to new Best Buy money or whatever. Yeah. Um, $20 would have meant something. Well, I've had, to, you know. I, more. I, I've, in, I've had to turn down gifts a bunch at, at different schools because it's like students want to give you something sometimes at the end of the semester mm -hmm. and then, but like you haven't turned in grades. Has a student just ever like, given you an apple? No, but like students have given me like fairly expensive bottles of wine and things like that. And I'm just like, bro, like take it home. I'm not taking this bottle. I haven't graded anything. I'm not like, this isn't payola. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. And they get upset, but it's just like, do you I, think other teachers take those gifts? Yeah, probably. I mean, which fine. Like that's totally fine. If I, I also don't care about wine. So maybe if they had given me something that I really cared about, maybe I'd take it. Like whiskey? No, like a... Like a first edition of something? Like a tickets to a monster truck show. Ooh. 
Uh, you want to read Egg's email? Yeah, sure. Meg's reaction to fake accounts. It's a long email. It's I'm been sure. a long episode already. 45 minutes. Oh, that's not bad. This book was quite frustrating to read. This email is difficult to write. I'm finding it difficult to write because I have a lot of complicated feelings that are hard to articulate into words. I it's apologize. It's like she's breaking up with us. I apologize in advance if this email ends up being scattered. Also, we're breaking up. She doesn't say that. I don't mind the fact that this book was, using Bobby's non-pejorative definition here, boring. I'm going to get that into the, like, I'm going to get boring into, the. I want more people to think of the word boring. boring is good. As, yeah, and also sloppy, too. Sloppy is the other word that I use as, like, a non-pejorative that, like, I think people mostly think of as pejorative. I don't since the sloppy boys became a thing. Okay. I don't really know anything about them, like, as, like, a group, but I like them calling themselves the sloppy boys. Yeah. Also sloppy steaks from I think you should leave. Anyway, I didn't like this book, Egg says, because the narrator was horrible. Mm -hmm. But then I felt, but then I feel like a hand-wringing liberal about it. Yeah, I agree. You are, you are a hand-wringing liberal about it. That by me hating her, she can smugly say that I have internalized misogyny. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I'd go that far, but sure. I think it's a, I think. Although actually I did say, I I did say, I think one of the reasons why we don't accept her as an unlikable character is because she's a woman. So maybe. I think there is something societal, societally true about that for mm-hmm. sure. She's just such a snake. The most frustrating part to me, which culminated from all of the little frustrations throughout the rest of the book, is when she says to Nell something like, quote, I hate being dependent on people. It feels a little selfish. The narrator is living in Germany and at this point in the novel has not attempted to learn the language at all. She's been so dependent on so many people to get her through the visa process. I was glad that Nell called her out on it, but it was still frustrating to read. That feels like such a minor part of the book to me that I, 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 I mean, but that was sure. the straw that broke Meg's back. I no, guess. I mean, I, I, I agree. I agree. But like, again, I don't like the, 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 why don't you just learn the language thing is like something that, uh, I guess we can be judgmental of Americans in Europe. But like, if someone said that about someone in America, like I would be like, what the, what the fuck? Like, come on. Yeah. Like let them just live. Yeah. What's the deal? Right. I think just because America has a stigma that we all suck. Largely. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not denying that. And also like American colonialism, like we want, we expect to be able to go everywhere and, and everyone will adapt to our language rather than them adapting to. Which is kind of the case. Like the wor- the rest of the world like allows us to live out that entitlement because they're like, you know, we'll speak English. And then we all act like, like in France that, you know, like that thing about France where it's like, oh, they'll like be rude to you if you don't even try to speak French. But it's just like. Uh, like okay like that's fine maybe, maybe they should i don't know like we, we we want it to be we want it both i i don't know i'm not being my favorite like thing this. is when someone from another country is like sorry that my english is so bad i'm just like no you have like near perfect english and like this is your third language yeah yeah i've yeah that's a i'm always surprised by that because obviously I, yeah obviously i have students that are like you know they have three or four languages under their belt so like they're writing they're like i'm sorry my writing's so bad i'm just like okay Honestly, Egg says, if you had told me that a man wrote this, I would have believed you. I actually thought at first the novel was actually Felix giving a, quote, fake account from the perspective of the narrator. But that's just the mark of satire, I guess. This does feel like the, you saying the satire and not satire really kind of messed Egg up a little bit. I think it did. I think, I, I think like, I, like, threw a hand grenade into that conversation and then, and then walked out and let them pick up the pieces. Hell yeah. Didn't turn, didn't turn around to watch the explosion. But I feel like I was already clear on the things that the narrator slash author was exposing, quote unquote, exposing. So it just served as frustration and didn't shed light on any new criticisms. Like, obviously, non-intersectional feminism is bad. Obviously, people can hide themselves in social media. Maybe if this was written 10 years ago, it would have been more impressive, but not in 2021 (laughs) when it was written. All right. Reading this so soon after listening to the Megan Boyle interview slash live blog episode made me think about the role of, quote, irony between the two books. Live blog's irony almost felt like it came from a place of joy and humor, whereas the irony in fake accounts felt more malicious, condescending, and serious. I, I think irony is almost always malicious, condescending, and serious. I don't I, I think I think mm-hmm. irony as like a tool for humor is not lighthearted at all. No. It's it's used like almost exclusively to berate and undermine. And I think that irony is something that is like incredibly, 
incredibly dangerous. And I would say that that uh, Megan Boyle's use of irony is um, like an irony that is self-destructive in 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 the context of that book. I don't think it comes from a place of joy. I think it comes from a place of of uh, uh, trying to like urge one through an incredibly difficult life circumstance. And, and uh, like allows like a protective shield that keeps you from recognizing all the things that are wrong in your life. Um, I do agree that there is like a sharp, sharp contrast between Lauren Euler and Megan Boyle in their in their approaches because Lauren Euler I think is bulletproof and Megan Boyle I think is opening her literally opening herself yeah, to bullets, st- standing in in the middle of a street naked while while inviting people to throw rocks at her like those they, they, you couldn't get to more different kinds of kinds of books here and i don't blame anyone for siding with megan boyle in this circumstance because siding with vulner- vulnerability especially socially like now like that's the move mm-hmm. that's what we should be doing mm-hmm. sh- well i i don't think that we should be siding with the character in in fake accounts who is um you know putting on so many layers of armor that you can't get to her right um, so I, you know, I agree with everything that, that, that Meg says there, except for that. I don't think the irony in, in live blog is joyful. Well, speaking of armor, Egg says the narrator of fake accounts seems to use irony as a kind of shield. If you don't like what she's doing, it's because she's doing it ironically in italics. Yeah. That's, that's the whole goddamn point. Okay. Sorry, 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 Meg. Sorry. I didn't mean to yell at you. Yeah. Go ahead. And if you don't understand, that's not her problem. That's, ex- that's exactly what's going on. Yes. All in all. I didn't really like this novel. Okay. Well, I mean, that's what irony, that's what irony is. That's why irony, like we, we will, like when we discuss infinite jest, like that is the, that is what infinite jest is about. Like as egg read infinite jest. Yeah. Does she like it? I don't know. I mean, she may have at the time and then now she'll probably have a different thought. It's, about it's, it. it's a, it's a hard, that's a hard book in a lot, in a lot of reason, in, in a lot of ways. And, and, and like, you know, it's hard to say what, what, what people like and what, like there's been so much discussion about it and so much stuff that has made people think different ways about it since then, that it's hard to, hard to know what the, what's a real reaction and what's the reaction of like a societal reaction to something. Yeah. If you want to write in about this book or any book that we've covered or not lottery at cage dot me, especially if you're in Saudi, especially if you're in Saudi Arabia, um, we are number 180. Currently, no, I think it's 183. We're the 180. I'm so sorry. We're the 183rd most popular books podcast in Saudi Arabia. So if you are Saudi Arabian, um, get out there and spread the word. Um, I'd like to by the next time that we get one of these analytics update, I'd like to be up to 180. Yeah, Carlos from Pod Status emailed us this morning. He's yeah, like, I, thought you, I thought you want to know you're big in Canada. Shout out to Canadians. Yeah, Canadians. They got it, but probably because. In Canada, most people speak English. Um, Number two on this list, that was Germany. And so shout out Berlin. They're going to love this. Out, They're going to love this Berlin. episode. Yeah. What I'll say from 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 that is today's crime is doing that thing where you uh, keep reading, like uh, clone someone's credit card with your phone oh, and, then, yeah. and then use their, their information. It's nefarious. You only like me when I'm me when